Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Fathering Project seminar tonight, which is on understanding the teenage brain. We'd like to welcome you and just explain the format for tonight's webinar, which will be a webinar with Dr. Steve Kassam, which will run for about 30 minutes. And then we're going to move to an open chat forum where we'll be welcoming David Forrest, a dad, a teenager, and also a teacher of teenagers at school to be part of a panel where you can ask questions and we'll direct those to both David Forrest and Dr. Steve Kassam. So please send your questions on the chat panel, which I'm going to show you where that is located now. If we move the slide, we'll see that you have a chat panel, just some housekeeping rules. You can send us a message anytime during this session we will be then taking your questions at the end and where we have multiples, we'll actually try and put those into one question. We'll have about 30 minutes for the question time and we'll try and promptly end at 8.30 tonight. So firstly, we'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Steve Kassam. Now, Dr. Kassam is a neuroscientist and he has a passion for understanding how our brains work, discovering new areas of the brain and also looking at new ways to map them in 3D imagery. Uh, Dr. Kassam was an undergraduate at Sydney University. He then went on to complete his honours at the Brain Mind Research Institute. He sub subsequently took up a dual PhD and he then went on to win the Peter Bancroft Award for his research in excellence and thesis, which looked at the effect of chronic stress and its effect on learning behaviours and the neurocircuits in the brain. Quite a mouthful. Steve has then gone on to work with Professor Paxanos, who is one of the world's highest regarded neuroscientists in the area of mapping the brain. And he has been studying in particularly the understanding of the teenage brain, which is what we're all here to learn about tonight. So we're very privileged to have you with us tonight, Dr. Kassim, and we'd like to thank you and I know as a mother of teenagers, I am so looking forward to hearing what you've got to tell me about my teenagers' brains. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. And um, I'm very happy to be here with uh, the Fathering Project to talk about this today. Um, so not, I don't know how much more I would add to um, Liz's lovely welcome, but um, uh, yes, I work in brain mapping. Um, the image of myself you see there is actually me looking at the human brainstem under the highest resolution image ever captured. Um, and the human brainstem is just at the bottom of the brain. Um, and um, so yes, as Liz has pointed out, I map the brain. We use uh, different technologies to do that. MRI, something you might be familiar with, but we even use some techniques that are quite old and, and we still look under the microscope um, as well. And you can see me still using a magnifying glass there. Um, and so to give a very brief overview of what we'll be going over, um, we'll be talking about, as the topic is, how the brain develops spe specifically in the teen years. The brain develops though from age zero all the way up to age 25. Um, and it's constantly engaging new parts of the brain during that period. But the most volatile period is going to be in the teen years um, to the point where it's remodeling itself, it's cutting out new, uh, cutting out inefficient connections, reinforcing uh, strong connections, important connections, helping us develop. This is influenced by hormones. This is going to be influenced by social interactions, our environments. And so in today's little mini lecture, little view of it, I won't be sugarcoating too much of the science. I do want us to um, be legitimate here. And hopefully I can talk through it slowly enough and clearly enough. I mean, I'm, I'm used to it every single day. Um, but I want to make sure the parents that are listening have the, the, the honest information at their, at their fingertips that they can take from this. And so to start, um, we want to talk about the fundamentals here. And so although not extraordinarily pertinent to the teen brain itself, we need to understand the map of the brain. Um, and I've, there's a diagram in front of you that divides the brain into its very basic parts, um, the four lobes, the cerebellum and the brainstem. And I'll talk briefly about how these parts of the brain will be engaged from childhood to adulthood. 
Um, in particular, if you can see my mouse wobbling around over on the frontal lobe, that's the part of the brain that's actually particularly involved in team development. But so we have a full scope of everything. We'll start at the bottom in the brainstem. Now, this is the part of the brain that controls all the most basic fundamentals of life, breathing, pumping of blood. Um, it transports the information from the brain into the spinal cord to let us move our hands and legs. And so this is the part of the brain that's actually common across all species as well. Every, every animal, as we know, that breathes needs a part of the brain that lets them breathe. And so evolutionarily, that's, that's the most important. And right next to it, we see the cerebellum. And so the cerebellum is actually Latin for mini brain, because uh, it sort of looks like a little miniature brain. And it's involved entirely with uh, fine motor movements. And so it's really large in some animals like the cat and the bird and really small in other animals that don't have such fine movement. In us, we, it's actually quite large um, as we have the fine ability to move our fingertips and, and even operate in musical instruments. Moving on to the lobes though, we see the occipital lobe in red and the temporal lobe in green. Now, these are the two parts of the brain that are basically on and ready to go from birth. And this is because we need to look, smell and hear where food is and where our parents are. So the occipital lobe is most involved with vision and the temporal lobe involved with smell and taste and hearing. Once we get to the point where we're sort of fumbling around a little bit and we're finding our legs, the parietal lobe sort of gets engaged. And this is the part of the brain that gives us spatial awareness, gives us, gives us more information from our sensations, from our fingertips and things like this. And then this thick black line that divides the brain in the middle sort of separates sensation and spatial awareness from movement, which is this little strip here, and then everything at the front, which sort of makes us human, our thoughts, our emotions, our decision making. And that's the part of the brain that becomes engaged probably from about the age of 12 onwards and uh, what we'll be focusing on today. And so I've selected a few parts of the brain across these images here that I really wanted to talk about with the teen brain to give you some scope. With that frontal lobe, and we've sort of taken a cut through the middle of the brain here, at the very bottom of it, in this red highlighted area, which is actually, if we went, if we went to our skulls, the parts of our brain just above our eyes, um, is the red part here, and that's called the orbital frontal cortex. And it's the last part of the brain to develop at about the age of 25, believe it or not, when it finally finishes. And it's the, the executive body of our brain. It tells us whether we should do something. It lets us evaluate our moves ahead of time, sort of like the chess player thinking moves ahead. Now, as I said, that doesn't really come into play until about the age of 25. So you can understand that without that vetoing body, we're sort of a impulse driven creature until then. And that's what's highlighted in red on this spinning brain here. That little red part of the brain there is called the amygdala. Now the amygdala is the part of the brain that basically gives us our impulses and our reward, reward seeking behavior. Everything that sort of makes us a teenager, if you will. <laughs> um, and it's also highlighted here in blue uh, on a different, different angle to sort of see where it is. So it's actually hidden sort of, if we were to remove the brain, as you can see in the, actually the x-ray does it even better sort of hiding at the bottom of the brain, near the brainstem. And it's heavily involved, like I said, in reward seeking and it makes us feel good, but it's also the part of the brain that makes us feel scared and also the part of the brain that reinforces our actions. And so with this scope in mind, we've sort of had a brief overview of the different parts of the brain. And we can see that the part of the brain that sort of makes, sort of makes us a teenager with all that impulse is that red spot there. And then as we develop at the end of our teen years, this red part on the orbital frontal cortex sort of suppresses it and finally lets us act normally again, but normal is a loose word. <laughs> and so to sort of break that down into a couple of dot points, during our teen years, a lot happens. There's the engagement of the new parts of the brain, like I said, and this is triggered through the release of hormones, principally our sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. These can lead to erratic behavior, but the scientific reason is because they are turning on different parts of the brain. 
that are created that haven't really been engaged before. And so it's sort of like using a new machine. You've got to figure out all the kinks and the brain's sort of figuring out itself at this time. And that can be a very stressful period for teens. Uh, and that's in addition to the fact that we're sort of figuring out who we are. We've got to go to school. We've got to go to, uh, we've got to confront bullies. We've got crushes. And this sort of all accumulates together with something called pruning. And so pruning is the period of the brain at the, in the teen years where the brain determines which connections are important, which connections are not, and refines and reinforces the ones that are most needed. And the reason this is, is actually when we're a child, we've actually got about 20 times more connections in our brain than we would when we're an adult. And you might think, well, why, why would we want to remove all these extra connections? Well, think of it sort of like having a thousand roads that all go to the same spot, but they're all one lane. <laughs> it's not going to be very helpful or very easy to get anywhere. So the brain's trying to figure that out and go, well, where do we need highways? Where do we need strong reinforced connections? Because we don't need 50 or thousands of pathways that will go to the same connection. We might only need a few if they're really maintained and reinforced. So the brain's going through and sort of scissoring away different connections and reinforcing others. So you can imagine that that's a volatile, very volatile period. And so I've got a couple of graphical representations of it here. And as, as the slide says, it prunes away unneeded pathways and unused pathways. And before I go into the diagrams, it's it sounds weird to hear, well, how can there be unneeded and unused pathways in the brain? Surely the, every pathway in the brain is being used. <laughs> Incorrect. When we're a child, like I said, we've got all these extra connections. Only a few of them are actually being used. There might be an erroneous traveler on a couple of the different pathways, but it's a constant refinement. And so it's these teen years where it goes to, well, we don't need these roads anymore. There's only a single person using them in the last 10 years. And so graphically, the way it can be represented is if we see each of these blue parts, these blue balls down here as a different part of the brain, and the arrows indicating different pathways that go between them. There is two types of pruning that goes on in the brain. On the left-hand side, it approaches the concept of having too many pathways, and so a muddlement of the roads, if you will. And so in the child's brain, we see that there's three connections from each of these blue parts of the brain to each other part of the brain, when really what we could do is that, and that's far more efficient. And so the brain cuts away all those extra parts that aren't needed anymore and gets us a nice, clean, strong, connected pathway between the two different areas of the brain. The other part of the pruning process is over here, where it's an inefficient pathway to get somewhere. This blue part of the brain is trying to speak to this blue circle, and it has to go through all these other parts of the brain to try and get there. When instead, during the pruning process, Pathways are generated that go directly where it needs to, and it prunes away the ones that it doesn't. And so I've actually got a map of Sydney here, which makes a perfect analogy for this, because as we're aware, Sydney wasn't a planned city at all, not like Canberra. It was built little bit by little bit with little roads and then other little roads and dead ends. And then we sort of got to the point where we got, well, let's have double wide roads and then we'll even have highways. So the Sydney, the Sydney roadmap is sort of just at the cusp of pruning. It's got all these extra pathways and all these extra roads, and it hasn't cut away yet a couple of the less used roads that <laughs> Sydney City might have. And what I really want to talk about as well is that this is a stressful period for the team. We can all recall back to our teen years being quite stressful, and it's because we're quite vulnerable to a, to a stress in this period. Outside of the hormones and the pruning, there's all the social pressure, and there's also this drive to try and find us some independence in our life. Biologically, we're only meant to really live to about 40, so during our teen years, there's a genetic drive, a biological drive for us to sort of become independent and find ourselves. And that's also combined with everything else, that's quite stressing. And as Liz pointed out at the beginning of this lecture, 
one of my areas of expertise is stress and particularly how it affects the brain. And what I've got on the side here is a brain cell, a neuron in a healthy person on the left and a stressed person on the right. And those, those black lines growing out of the cell are connections. So what you see is there's actually far less connections. The, the brain cells deteriorated. Now, what I need to clarify though, is that this isn't pruning, this is damage. Pruning doesn't leave a sporadic, uh, unkempt uh, collection of pathways like this. The brain cell over here has actually already been pruned. These cells have been taken from a healthy person that's an adult. So if we're pruning and we're stressed, not only are you losing the connections from pruning, which you're meant to lose, but you're also going to start losing connections you weren't meant to lose. So that's just a visual representation. Stress can be a good thing though. As we know, it's in, you sort of get the you sort of get a little boost when you're in a test or a public talk. And stress is needed. It's a it's an important part of our brain. It tells us when to avoid something actually, um, and you sort of feel it as little butterflies. We, we, it's an internal detector. But when stress is chronic, and it can be chronic in teen years, especially with bullying and especially with COVID cyberbullying, it can be a quite chronic situation where you're being stressed repeatedly every day. Um, and after a certain period of time. If this stress becomes chronic, that's when it really does damage to the point where the deterioration of the brain cells we see in these two pictures gets to the point where it's not just deteriorating the cells, but it's actually starting to deteriorate whole parts of the brain. And so this chronic stress, particularly in teens, in combination with everything else, has been shown to be linked to depression and anxiety disorders. These disorders usually show themselves during the teen years because this is when we're most vulnerable and sensitive to stress, but also because they are stressful periods in our life. Um, you'll be hard, hard set to find a teen that doesn't say they're stressed, or at least pretends, they might pretend they're not stressed, but they are. And we sh you should try to remove the stress if you can, whether it be the bullying or um, perhaps someone that's, you've had a crush on someone and they've turned you down and let's move through it. And stress can come in all sorts of different ways. But if you can't remove the stress, so you, can't, you, you cannot prevent it from becoming chronic, an element of my research has shown that if you can make the stress predictable, you mitigate lots of the different damage that can happen from stress. And so this is a sneaky way you can try and create an enriched environment for your teen, if you will. You don't want to ever restrict their freedoms. And I bring that up because freedom usually leads to stress of some description, especially when you're figuring yourself out and finding yourself. You want to, you'll go and do something that's silly or you'll go and, you know, we've all done something we probably shouldn't have at some point when we were a teen. And we need that freedom to develop because we learn from that. But that freedom can lead to stress. And so if you recognize that your, your teen is heavily stressed, try and either remove the stressor and if you can't remove the stress, try and make it predictable. Now, a te teens are smart, humans are smart, and teens are, e are very cunning. As you know, if you try to help them blatantly, they're gonna resist it. Well, many will resist it. So you wanna try and be a bit more sneaky with the ways you try and help. And so you wanna try and generate predictable environments, not entirely predictable, of course, but give opportunity for predictability and an opportunity to, re to escape from those stresses. So sport and sport clubs are a sneaky way to try and do that. They're always at a set time, they're always with, with people, they're always in a similar environment and context. And although it seems a little silly, like, oh, sh surely that's not enough, it, it is. And we've, we've seen it repeatedly in our research that something as simple as just one predictable event a week can reduce overall chronic stress. And it doesn't necessarily have to be sport especially at the moment with COVID, but it could be something that's a hobby, whether it's painting or miniatures or anything that's even got a hobby club, any of those elements. Now, these obviously seem like things we've always been told, I'll find a hobby, find a hobby. 
the reason we want to find a hobby is because it removes stress um, outside of it being pleasurable, of course, as well. We always enjoy our hobbies. Um, and, if, and if a hobby club still isn't available, just try and generate predictable things in other ways, whether it be um, having dinner at the same time or whether it's seeing grandma at the same day or seeing family on the same day. Little things like that, as long as they're not too forced, can really help reduce those stress levels and help protect the neurons that are already going through a very rough time, um, having hormones impacted on them and having them be pruned through the brain. And just going ahead, there are other mental disorders we need to be aware of that are prevalent during teen years. The most prominent one is schizophrenia. It's a disorder that only presents itself during teen years. It doesn't present, it extraordinarily presents itself rarely as an adult or as a child. And for those of you that aren't aware of what schizophrenia is, it's a psychosis disorder associated with hallucinations. And we believe through research that the development of schizophrenia is usually associated with errors in this pruning process. Whether it be the brain is pruned accidentally, the wrong connections, or it's left bad ones that are muddling up the works of the brain. It conglomerates together and presents itself as this schizophrenic disease. And unfortunately, even if this is addressed early, it's very difficult to try and uh, treat schizophrenia because it's so biological. It's, it's connections in the brain that have been mapped the wrong way. And there's no other period in time where we get to reprune our brain. So it's an important period in a teen's life specifically for this. In addition, usually during the teen period is when we get our first exposure to drugs, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or otherwise, usually through a friend or something like that. It's usually where we figure it out and we, we learn about it and we're exposed to it. Now, obviously, you, it's going to be difficult to try and remove it entirely, but we need to have some information here for both yourselves and for your teens. In that schizophrenia specifically significantly increases its chances of development with marijuana and psychedelic use. With psychedelics like marijuana and others, they impact on these pathways in the brain. They modify them, they change them. They, they, that's how the drug works. That's how they, you get the experience of being psychedelic. And so you can see how this is related to the pruning process. And you can see how it's going to be related to development of schizophrenia. And we're not talking simple increases like one or two times more, up to 20 times more likely to develop things like schizophrenia with psychedelic and psychedelic use. So take this information with you as well. And, and you can take it and not just inform them, oh, don't use drugs because of whatever. You can tell them, well, a neuroscientist has gone and told you, no, you're going to be impacting on how your brain is cutting itself up. And we don't want that. And that, and that, that information is also important for a team. They need to know because they're becoming independent themselves. They are no longer in the sequesterment of, of a child and a family. Biologically, they're developing, their brain's developing, they're trying to become independent and information gives them that agency. And if you, it, with information as well, yes, there will be some times that it, it leads to something not most desirable, but in most situations, if information is given and shared fairly, that gives the agency to the teen to know, okay, if I'm going to use psychedelics, it's going to like significantly increase my chances of schizophrenia because it's going to be interacting with the pruning process that my brain has. And so just before we move on to something else, which is personal to me, which I wanted to share with all of you, is attention span. And we're, <laughs> we're coming up to about halfway through the presentation here. And the attention span of an adult is actually about 15 minutes. And so you usually we need a little bit of something extra with a little little side little side thing or a little little joke or something to bring our attention back. With a teen, that's even less. And with a child, it's less even less than that. And so keep that in mind if you're if you're doing something with your teen or your child that the attention span of an adult is 15 minutes. And we can force ourselves through it. But if we can just do something different for a little bit and then come back to it like I'm doing here, <laughs> it just gets our interest back again. And we want that with, with everything, with all your interactions with people, but with your children as well. 
speaking of which, although I'm not a father myself, not yet, I do have a personal experience that's quite related to all of this. But my sister, who's much younger than me, than me, is going through her teen years right now. And it's been a very bumpy ride so far uh, for myself and the rest of the family. Um, I've had to be a sole carer for her uh, a few times. My mother's had a, had two strokes and my father has a back disability that prevents him from uh, always being available. And so I've had to be a sole carer for her. And she suffers quite severe stress during this period and has actually gotten to the point where she's developed psychoses and depression. And this has actually been partially induced through drug use, um, which we were unfortunately made aware of. And so this is a heavy burden for me and, uh, and my family. And I speak to you with some context here. Um, it has been a heavy burden, but it's, that's not something to dismiss. And it has been stressful for me, but it's not something to dismiss. It's not the end of the world. She's coming through the other side and it's just a turbulent period. With the support and assistance and information and agency, she's moving through it and she's going to end up to be a very lovely lady. And so I say that with, I say that to you all here because it's not, it's going to be scary and it can be more scary for some than others. And there will be bumps along the way. And you have to look at the thing holistically. It's not just a year, it's not just a week or a month or a year. It's basically 13 to 25 before the brain stops developing, with the most volatile period being between 13 and 20. So you have to look at it as a long trajectory. There will be bumps along the way, but as long as overall it's going in an upward direction, it'll all come up daisies. And with information and understanding of all these processes, which I hope to give you through this, you'll have that information to hopefully help you see things better and also accommodate these things better. Something that's important as well, biologically, we aren't machines, we're not computers. Although many parts of our life sort of force us into this, <laughs> we were sort of designed just to pick berries, hunt a couple of animals, and then sort of lounge around for the rest of our time. Um, inherently as social creatures. All those parts of the brain that I spoke about at the beginning, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe, all of them work together to create a social situation. They either induce social interaction or influence social interaction. Whether it be reading facial cues, whether it be smelling someone's pheromones, whether it is understanding someone's behavior or whether it's trying to court someone or even if it's just trying to make a friend. Everything we do is social. We're not a machine. <laughs> you can't just put oil into us to fix us. We, we beat the Neanderthals in, this, in the race when we were becoming, when between Homo sapiens because we're social. Not because we were bigger or smarter, but because we're social and we worked together as, as you, in units and groups. And so I bring this up because it's not going to be a simple fix. It's not just putting oil into the gears. It's not just removing stresses. It's being social as well and understanding that it, they need to be social. And so encourage that when you can and let them be social. Give them some freedom to socialize. They'll quickly figure out some friends aren't good and some friends are. And they'll refine that skill as they get older. But importantly, for yourselves as parents as well, you need to be social. Whether it's family, work friends, your own friends, stay social yourself because it's one of the most important things to keep your brain healthy. And if you're social and healthy, you can influence those around you to be social and healthy and your teens will see you being social and healthy and they'll hopefully wanna be social and healthy themselves. Now with, <laughs> with COVID of course, that's going to have some difficulties because we can't see each other anymore and we're, we're sort of doing as we are now through zoom and 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 uh, webinars and go to services and all sorts of other things and that is social and it's still good to have but there's more than just that we're not just visual cues and auditory cues 
there's smells, there's body language, there's nuance to it, there's delays, there's rosiness in the cheeks. So much of your brain is dedicated to picking all this up and we need to keep it all healthy and working. So just to keep that in mind. So we're sort of getting to the end here and I want to take give you some really important tips to take with you. Just to remind yourself, we've gone over them a little bit, but just to remind yourself again, this is a period of high stress for your team. Keep that in mind for yourself. We can sometimes forget that through our own stress, we sort of ignore the stress of others. Stress exists to inform us that we're going through something that's stressful and undesirable, but also informs others that we're going through something stressful and undesirable. Just to remind yourselves as well that the brain is a literal maelstrom at the moment. It's already in, a, in an adult constantly going off, but in a teen, it's constantly going off and there's hormones and there's pruning and there's increased sensitivity to stress. It's a tornado, a maelstrom, as I said. Again, keep that in mind. A little bit of compassion is all is going to be take you a long way, a very long way here. As I said, the brains are being pruned, just like a good garden. It's being pruned is a good example, is a good metaphor. It's new connections are being made, new flowers are blooming. Some plants that were dying, they're being pulled out. The weeds are being removed. These pathways are being reinforced and they're being cut. And so we need to we need to foster and enrich this environment to ensure that this is going to create a healthy brain. They are the teens for you parents, they're taking their first steps to find themselves. Whether you were recently a teen or it's been a while now, you would have gone through the same steps. But hopefully with this information, it can make that an easier process for both you and them. They're finding themselves, they're figuring out who they are, what silly things like what music they like, what art they like, but also how they deal with bullying, how they deal with bosses, how they deal with orders, how they deal with friends, how they deal with betrayal, how they deal with all sorts of things that make up a person. They're gonna need guidance through this period and they're gonna need some boundaries. Hopefully those boundaries come in the form of predictors to help remove those stresses, but they can come in all sorts of different ways. Usually just being there and being supportive and encouraging little things you find within them that make them either unique or they're really good at these elements, encourage them. Those, that can be a little part of guide, a little bit of guidance. With my sister, she has a love for drawing and, and anime, Japanese cartoons. So I've been encouraging her to, to draw more and do more art because why not? Um, she, she enjoys it and she's a little bit embarrassed by it and things like that, but who cares? work through it, I'll give you some support, I'll buy you some things. And another thing, although not the most encouraged, but in particularly severe situations, like my sister, it can be a good middle ground, is video games as well. We can, you can use them to sort of create little escaped universes for them to hide in. Not always the most encouraged activity, because as you can imagine, it's going to lead to some other problems, isolation and things like that. But with my sister, where it's been quite severe, and other parents which might have other severe situations as well, encouraging hiding in a video game can be a good middle ground. And also, video games can be a social outlet as well. So I bring that up just because sometimes I hear parents' fear of video games. There is definitely negatives to them, but there can be some positives and they can be used as at least a band-aid to get us through other different steps. But if you can find other hobbies, do those as well. Drawing and art expression is an amazing one. Sort of already covered the next point, which is to create predictive environments. Don't make it too obvious because teens are very smart and they're gonna know that you're trying to influence their world and they're going to know that you're going to try and help them. And for some reason, teens don't like that. So try to make it a little bit less obvious. Just create, make things a little bit more predictable. And you'll, you'll see over the course of, it won't be immediate, but over the course of a couple of weeks, a couple of months, their stress levels will deteriorate and they'll mitigate and they'll disappear. The last tip I want to take away, and 
is comes from research from dementia, but also is relevant to teen brains in particular. And that are the three most important features of the brain in descending order. Diet, socialization, and exercise. The food we put in us is very directly associated with how healthy our brain is and how well we behave. There are certain diets you want to look for. We don't want to always have McDonald's and, and fast food and everything, though a couple of, you know, spoiling yourself every now and then is fine. We want to have food diet that is high in fiber. We want to have lots of greens. We want to have red meat not too often. We want to have red meat probably about two to three times a week. We want to have fish about two to three times a week. We want to have a couple of nuts. We want to have a couple of grains, a bit of cheese and some eggs. If you can, squeeze in some olive oil. Scientifically, that's been shown to be the best diet to keep the brain healthy. The worst diet, as you can imagine, is lots of trans fats, lots of chips, lots of takeaway. Try to avoid that if you can. It's going to be very difficult to try to argue that with a teen. I mean, even I as an adult <laughs> cave every now and then and go get something that I probably shouldn't have. But if you can remember a part of our brain, the amygdala, that's directly linked to that. It's been so associated with the rewarding feeling that, that fatty foods has, that even as an adult, the orbital frontal cortex, if you remember that part of the brain, still doesn't have the veto power to always overrule the amygdala. And so sometimes even as adults, we, we lapse and we wanna get something sneaky when we shouldn't. I mean, today I had a cream donut with lunch, which I definitely didn't need to have. But it creates a reference point for the teen where the amygdala is going off, it's going crazy, but the orbital frontal cortex isn't there yet. So they're gonna have difficulty with diet. Don't force it, just create an encouraged environment to eat better. Socialization, again, extremely important. It's going to be ensure a healthy brain just on the level that we are social creatures. But with that pruning process, like I said, it's going to be associated with pruning connections that are not used and reinforcing those that are. And we wanna really foster that socialization during teen years. I had some prob problems with bullying I mean, I, by working through them and confronting them, but also socializing with supported, supportive friends and with family and parents. It would have really reinforced my ability and gave me the tools I needed to, to move through those social confrontations. And socialization though isn't always bad, it's, it can be good as well. And so we, we really need to focus on socialization. With dementia patients, for example, the biggest predictor of preventing Alzheimer's is socialization with family, with friends, with anybody. The last point as the, one of the most important features of the brain is exercise. We all exercise a little bit less than we should. We should all try to exercise more. We wanna try and get in 20 minutes a day if we can. COVID permitting, of course, it's a little bit difficult, but go for your daily walk. See this in your teen though. Some teens really love the idea of exercise and they really get into those endorphins because they're associated with the amygdala again. So you've got the endorphins and the amygdala in sync. Can work out really well. Other teens, their amygdala gets associated with other things. Try to encourage exercise. If they don't want to do rugby, suggest soccer. If they don't want to do soccer, come up with something else. I actually found when I was a teen that any formalized sport I've actually resisted against because I knew my parents were trying to, to force it on me. But what, I re what really worked for me was just working out in the garage with dad. That really worked, going for a run, going for a walk and lifting weights. That, that really worked for me. Um, getting older, I've got a bit of a tummy, but <laughs> they, we want to try and encourage that exercise in the teen and then create good habits as well to carry forward into adulthood. And so I want to finish here with this picture of a, of a lovely garden and refer back to the analogy I made with the pruning of the brain being similar to the maintenance of the garden. You wanna prune away the weeds and foster the flowers. Get new flowers, more vibrant flowers, more vibrant plants, cut away all the weeds and cut away the hidden flowers like sunflowers and dandelions. <laughs> the brain can do this by itself as long as it's got good support. So we wanna keep that support and sorry, we want to foster that support and acknowledge that this is an important period. The pruning process can't happen again. 
Although I use the garden as an analogy, the gardener can come back and prune the garden whenever he wants. The brain will not come back and prune it again. And I hope to finish there. I've gone over a little bit, I apologize, but I hope the information has been very helpful. And I believe now we've got some questions and David Forrester is going to be coming in to, uh, to help answer those. We'll be able to answer them as best as we can. That's great. Thank you, Steve. Um, Dave is actually, you're still muted, Dave. So perhaps if you unmute yourself, I do have some questions here for you. Um, so I think the first one, perhaps the first two might actually be directed at Steve. Um, Steve, we've got one here from Ben. What ages does the brain pruning usually start? And are there any telltale signs in the behaviour of the teen? Yes. And they're the very, the very obvious telltale signs. Once you start to see the mood swings, that's when the pruning starts. So that's usually going to be about age 11, plus or minus a couple of years, of course, because that's when the sex hormones, the testosterone and the estrogen, influence the brain and jumpstart this whole process. So telltale signs are going to be the hormone uh, mood swings and the age grab's going to be about a year, basically at the age of 11, 11, 12, because boys develop a tiny bit later. Okay, thank you. And then the runner up to that is actually a question from Ron. At what age does the pruning settle down and is it different for males and females? There is a slight difference and thank you for the question, Ron. Um, the pruning doesn't settle down till about age 25. It's, it's funny that we say we're adults at 18 and which from a neuroscientist perspective, I would warn that 18 is definitely not an adult. And we're right in the middle of that volatile pruning process. Um, and so it all died down about the age of 25. And um, I, can't, I just I missed the other part of your question. There was, uh, can it, can it, uh, oh, is there a difference between genders? That's is right. That, yeah, males um, and females. Boys mm -hmm. will, women, uh, girls will prune and develop a, about a year ahead of time, about 24. And boys will, as boys are probably be a little bit later and finish at about 25. Right. Well, we've got a question here that could be a good one for um, David as well. Um, why do teens become less communicative, especially with their parents? And what can we do to keep the communication going? Oh, well, as Steve said, it's a, it's a journey of things all changing, but I believe from my years of experience with teaching and, and as a parent, it's part of that time when uh, up to about 12 where we are dependent on our parents but in that next phase from 12 as we've just talked through to 25 we really have to uh, find our independence and that is a natural time when kids pull away um, so that communication is broken at that time but it's okay it's it's meant to it's part of society developing and the kids growing and and becoming the different people that they need to be to keep this whole society and community and, and to do that. And socialising socialization that uh, Steve was talking about is probably a really good thing for that in that time. So it's, it's that pulling away um, during that season that I believe is both healthy, but part of the challenge. Steve, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Um, David's basically touched on it. I, I, like I said, it's 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 a part of that the brain's drive to sort of become your own self and, and try and find that independence as an adult. So naturally, you're going to try and remove pull yourself away from that sequesterment as a kid, but hopefully it comes back and <laughs> and hopefully you find some good friends along the way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got one here from Tom. Um, freedom versus strict guidelines is a difficult path to walk as a parent of a teenager. What advice can you give me? Do you want to start, Dave? <laughs> yeah, look, I, it, it's a funny word, way to say it, but there is freedom, there's freedom in boundaries. And um, if your kids know that you're going to pick them up at 11 o'clock, which Steve has talked about the predictability. There's a freedom you give your teenager, but you're going yes. to be there at a certain time. And it, it's already putting a signal in here that says, at 11, I need to be at the place I'm supposed to be. So um, that's, yeah, that's my thoughts on that, Steve. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I will. And I'll, I'll go over it just very briefly. Um, 
and it, it's exactly what Dave said, is giving predictability actually gives freedom on, on a biological level. So the reason predictors are so good at removing stress is because the removal of a stressor has to do with agency or freedom in a decision. So when, when the experiments have been performed on, on animals and on humans, where they've been given the freedom to, rem, to remove the stressor themselves, it, the, the scientists have been able to actually pull apart that process and go, it's not actually the stressor itself that's causing the damage. It's the freedom over the stressor that causes the damage. And by making it predictive, we're artificially giving them the freedom over that stressor. And so it's exactly what um, what Dave said, is by making at something at 11 o'clock, you've given the team the freedom to do whatever they want before 11, versus I'm just gonna pick you up at some time that's there's no freedom in that you you're going to be walking on eggshells yeah 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 thank you um so we've got it's it's they're coming in thick and fast so we've got one here from larry how will the brain development influence the emotions for the teens what is the normal difficult and aggressive emotions so what are the normal ones well it's it's a hard thing to actually answer that because there is no normal emotions unfortunately, as desperately as we want them to be. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is, is because when this pruning process goes on, this development process and this engagement of different parts of the brain happens, it's not set across every across everyone. Some people engage certain parts earlier, some people are gonna prune certain parts earlier. And so this is gonna create a different montage of emotions and behavior. And hopefully at the other end, it all balances out. And think of it more, if we had, you know, 10 different parts of the brain and every combination of them creates a different emotion. Well, if I pruned one, two, and three first, and another kid pruned four, five, and six first, their combinations are gonna be different for those two teens. And so it's hard to really say, is there a, what's normal and what's not? It's normal to be volatile, <laughs> I, I guess mm. is what I can say. Yeah. All right. Um, so we've got another one here. Um, this one's um, from Ron. Is it possible that heavy use of mind altering substances like alcohol or marijuana um, delay maturity or the length of pruning time? Um, marijuana, the psychedelics, just quickly. So psychedelics, which marijuana is a part of, doesn't delay the pruning. It just, for lack of a better word, screws it up and it prevents it from being done properly. So like I said, they'll prune the wrong ones or leave the, leave the wrong ones. Alcohol, though, you're absolutely correct, it stunts this process. It's not specifically stunting the pruning itself, it just stunts the entire development scheme. So not just the brain, but it stunts the hormones, it stunts the socialization, it stunts everything. And so abuse of alcohol can definitely stunt that growth. And that, like I said at the end, if you miss that, that window of opportunity for that development, it, you don't get another chance. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, there's another one here, um, which could be a good one for Dave as well. Um, how do we try to, it's from Leo, how do we try to reduce the mood swings or bad behaviour without taking things away? So without taking away their toys like PS4 and what have you? Yeah, um, interesting. I'm just going to, without dealing with the mood swings, I'm just going to throw the word boredom in here. And as parents, we often say, um, if we pull things away from the kids, there's going to be a, a reaction. Um, there's research that says, and I've done it with my own kids on a road trip. I said, we're going to put the phone away uh, and put the phones down. And for 20 minutes, you're going to guess what I'm thinking. So what happened in that 20 minutes, and this is what the research told me, was that we would come up with games to play and find things to do in that time. And by that as an example, by the time that 20 minutes went through, we were actually doing other things and moving forward. Um, so hopefully that, does that sort of, Steve, does that sort of address that question in that sense? Absolutely. It, it's, and you, you, you've talked about the research I'd bring up, so I won't add much at all, except that there's an old saying, boredom's best friend is mischief. Um, and, and that's the case. So if you remove the PS4, but don't give them something to replace that with, you're only gonna make things worse. And so Dave's pointed out that a fun little game like that is such a good distractor. And we'll, we'll, uh, well as, as he's seen and as the research shows, we should 
help accommodate those mood swings. Yeah, and we and we create that space, and and there is all in the boredom is also creativity. But if you're just removing something and you're not putting anything back in, you're just creating a conflict. But if you're saying, hey, let's try this, not at a time when it is a point of conflict. Hey, we're going to try this. We're going to go for a drive. Let's try something different. See what it is. And in in that space, there's creativity. It's not going to work every time, guaranteed. And there'll be some conflicts. Uh, but that's part of the uh, normal emotion, as you said, <laughs> the tumultuous yes. sea of estrogen <laughs> and testosterone that is teenage years, you know. Uh, yeah. So we've got a uh, another question here, and it's about um, cultivating good habits. It's from Shi Hong. So we're trying to cultivate some good habits with our teen, but she's just being rebellious towards instructions and order. She will disobey by walking away when we're trying to make a stronger stance um, or to have her do something. How can you advise us, please? <laughs> I'll let you go first, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. Been there, done that. And it's about consistency. And uh, there's always a debate when we talk about parenting, I think between quality versus quantity. Uh, if you're a quality parent that's there for two fantastic hours and we go to a rock show uh, once a month, that's quality, awesome. We went and saw Pink or whoever the person was, that's a quality game. But parenting isn't about quality, it's about quantity. And you've just got to be there as often as you can. And the Fathering Project, we talk about being there for your kids. Um, you've you, you got to, have that challenge and that dismissal what we just talked about and trying to cultivate that good habit it's the quantity of consistency that's going to make the difference um in the in that behavior so uh we talked steve and i talked a bit about it, it takes a time to cultivate a new habit th this week and um today and if that's it we just have to stick with it stick with that habit and um as a parent, maybe get some support. <laughs> the, the, the only thing I would add, and it sounds a little bit inhumane, <laughs> um, is to, just like every other animal, we respond to reward. Like we, we do the things we do because they're rewarding to us in some way, whether it's because we feel a nice self, sense of self-satisfaction or because we insisted that we're gonna have that cream donut for lunch. Um, and so just keep that in mind in the sense that to create a habit, there has to be, if they don't want that habit, then there's gonna to have to be another reward to help prompt that habit, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thanks, Steve. We've got one here from Karen, um, might be a good one for Steve. What are your thoughts around neurofeedback training centers and products in general for teens? Is there any value for teens, um, especially those with impulsiveness, self-control or regulation challenges? It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer fairly, but I, I'll say these points. If, if the psychologist or the psychiatrist that you've seen first has suggested taking on these activities, do them. If a psychologist or a psychiatrist hasn't suggested doing these activities, then they're not appropriate for your child. That, unfortunately, that was a very big blanket statement, but unfortunately, I can't really co comment any more confidently than that. And I apologize, but it's the, the problem with those neurofeedback uh, 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 um, interventions are that there's not a huge amount of research there, but we right. know but a psychiatrist would be able to determine if it's appropriate. Okay, so um, we've got one um, here from Luke. Um, my son smokes pot occasionally. Uh, we've had some concerns, um, and tonight's really given me an eye opener um, around that too. How should I approach the conversation with him? Mm. Oh, mm. <laughs> well, with a I, lot of love. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'll let Dave speak after me because I'm, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and sort of just quote myself. Is the only advice I can give is give as much information as you can. Don't mm. approach it, approach it honestly and fairly, and go, well, look, here's some information, here's some research. It shows that pot use is going to lead to these effects. 
I want you to have this information to see if that, you know, I, I don't know, take that information and see if it can influence them. Um, what would you say, Dave? Yeah, it's it's a journey, and it's it's um, you've got to love your child unconditionally, and you might have a child who's doing all the right things, and you might have a child that's doing some of the challenging things or a whole lot of challenging things, um, and you've got to love them through it. Now that sounds a very throwaway line, um, but that's where, as a parent, sometimes you've got to step in and step up, and as a fathering project, I think that's our message is. Um, for dads to do that as well and it's and it's great to have the partnership between parents in that regard and sometimes that's possible sometimes it's not but it is a and we'd also say at the fathering project that you need a team approach you know this is where the beauty of school communities come in you've got uh, counselors and teachers and and principals at schools that are really um, excellent in this regard they know this sort of uh, process. You've also got uncles, aunties, grandfathers, um, cousins, people. I would just say get that community around you. Steve's talked tonight about the power of socialisation, you know, diet, socialisation and exercise. Well, if you're socialising in a group that is all smoking pot, guess what? Everyone's going to be smoking pot. But if your child is outside, is the only one in your family or that social group, then they're going to be standing outside and it's going to be easier for them to move away. So I'd really look at all those uh, bigger team approach, as, as we'd say in the father approach, it's to get the team together, not just trying to do it on your own. Well Thanks said. For that. that was very well said, thank you. Um, so this will be our last question tonight. It's from Leo. Um, just wondering, is Instagram part of socialization or is it a bad place for teens? So is it better for them to be speaking <laughs> their friends on the phone or while playing a game online with their headphones is that better than um, Instagram it's 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 difficult I, I'm gonna pop in first Dave if you don't mind just from yeah, experience you know you go, mate. that's great because um, one of the something that I know my sister um, is heavily involved with is Instagram and I think it's a lot more prominent with girls than it is with boys um, it's I think it has the opportunity to definitely be helpful and also be very toxic. In the situation where you just need a little bit of validation from your friends and you want to share some fun ideas a day at the park or whatever, no harm in it at all. If anything, it could only be helpful. If it's looking at yourself and using it as a measure to value yourself, well, then I feel that it's probably not going to be very helpful and going to be quite toxic because then you're not validating yourself and you're not looking at yourself and determining yourself from your own eyes, but instead giving that power to someone else hmm. and playing on the idea of freedom. You've sort of given away all your freedom. If you let likes, if you will, determine your, your importance. Yeah. Um, phrase someone's used with me lately is comparison is a thief of joy. And oh, that's, part of the yeah. challenge, you know, comparison is a thief of joy. And I've seen it. Uh, I probably even feel, felt it myself sometimes watching my own Instagram going, I wish I had that, you know, new surfboard. I wish I could surf that big wave. And my mood changes. And I've seen it change in kids. Um, and I, I've seen it change in my own daughters. Um, so it can be a, a thief of joy. But as Steve has said, it's an awesome platform for creativity if used in the right way. And the ideas and the things that I see, my daughters use Pinterest boards and things like that and they come in. Um, we as a family spent time overseas. It's a great way to stay connected with what people are doing all around the world. So it can have a great positive impact on the socialization, but the heavy use of it, and the, no, that's my main point. Comparison is a thief of joy. And if they're really comparing um, themselves with what they see on there, they're comparing up against something that's not going to be true. Um, and I'll just add this little point for parents out there, especially parents of daughters. Um, if you ever seen anyone down the beach taking a selfie, how many do they take to get the perfect one? How many do they take? And then how many filters do they get on it? 
before they get it to exactly the picture that goes, wow, look at me. And that's not truth. It's not real. But if that's the standard that your kids, both boys and girls, are trying to hold up to, it's really going to take the joy away. So, yeah, that's comparison is a thief of joy. Don't let them get too caught in that. that, that very well said. I'd add one tidbit if I can, just before we go. Mm. And it's not directly relevant to that question, but it, I know it's going to be in a couple of parents' minds because it's been in parents' minds for, for centuries, is don't be afraid of technology. Oh, right. we're, with Instagram and other social medias, we're scared of it because we're not familiar with it. We didn't grow up with it. We didn't learn it. And realistically, we're probably not using it as good as someone else is. But think back to your grandparents and the radio. I remember my grandfather getting in horrible fights, telling me about horrible fights, I should say, with his father about the use of the radio and how it was not appropriate and you shouldn't be using the radio and all this other stuff. It's, it's, it's a little bit of fear in there. Don't be fearful of technology. Every technology has its perks and its disadvantages. Yeah. And um, I would just add, Steve, one of the things you said, uh, about your your sister was that you said the art stuff and the thing you you are giving her hope for the future and um and you can see that it's a challenging time now but you can see there's a place where she can go which is going to be fantastic and i'd say that to fathers mothers parents out there that take time to look at your kids look for their uniqueness write down how they are unique and then think about how that uniqueness can be used in the future for to make this world a better place and then actually go and tell them and that will give your kids hope and it will show them that you, they've seen that you've seen them they've been heard that you know them and that they have a place in this world to go forward um, with who they are and that's a really key key point for um for this so yeah thanks Thanks, Steve. Well, thank you too thank you. very much to everybody who's attended tonight's webinar on understanding the teenage brain. I'd like to thank all the attendees. I'd like to thank Dr. Steve Kassam and David Forrest for your amazing contributions tonight and helping us understand that uh, teenagers aren't from another planet. They're just going through some major changes in their brain. I'd also like to draw attention to next week's um, webinar and next week we actually have cricket dad Peter Smith on the fathering values and resilience for our webinar with Dr Bruce Robinson and we're going to be looking at a moment in cricket history where a father was called to stand by his son I think it's going to be amazing conversation looking at fathering values and how Peter Smith really helped to build resilience in his son. So I hope you'll all join us the same time next week. And with that, I'll say good night, wish you all well, and thank you again to Dr. Steve Kassam and David Forrest. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.